I uh, studied physics at Johns Hopkins uh, for my BA degree, and then I got a master's in business administration at the University of Chicago. I uh, got my PhD after that at uh, Portland State University in system science, which was an interdisciplinary program. And uh, my thesis uh, dealt with a range of uh, both astronomy and geology area. Uh, studying a new phenomenon of how the uh, galactic center can affect the Earth through uh, cosmic ray uh, volleys. My interest in uh, electrogravitics, which is uh, Towson Brown's work, uh, began in uh, 1985. Um, I, I was interested because the physics theory I had been working on predicted a coupling between electricity and gravitation which is pretty much what Brown was illustrating experimentally. Uh, in particular, let's say in the standard physics theory with like general relativity, which is our current theory of gravitation, uh, you have only one polarity to gravity. So masses can only attract. And there's no possibility for gravitational repulsion or anti-gravity. Anything that physicist comes up with that is sort of speculating uh, outside of that framework. Uh, there, physicists have proposed that there might be some coupling between electricity and gravitation at very high energies and that's one of their reasons for building these huge particle colliders is they're hoping to find this connection. Uh, if, if they just look before their eyes, the experimental evidence, there is a connection but it, it, it just let normal laboratory voltages that you can generate. Brown had a, kind of a maypole that he built with uh, two disks that he would charge the disks and uh, the f leading edge of each disk had a wire that would emit positive ions and the body of the disk was negatively charged. Can you see that? Does oh, it show up well? And uh, he would charge uh, an initial experiment, this type that you see here, he charged with 50,000 volts, about 50 watts of power and this would spin around around 12 miles per hour in this circuit. And then he is reported to have done a, a similar thing but larger on a 50-foot course charging to 150,000 volts and these were going several hundred miles per hour. So if you can picture about like model airplane speed, model airplanes can go several hundred miles an hour. And uh, this was uh, done something around 1953 in Pearl Harbor and it demonstrated to some top brass from the military, and uh, the subject is reported to have become classified after that. They, they were so impressed with the results. Some people have said, well, this is due to ion propulsion, that the ions coming off of the uh, front of the craft somehow blow the craft and cause it to move. And there have been experiments done to show this is not the case. In fact, Brown uh, tested his uh, idea in a vacuum. Uh, uh, so there was el eliminating the idea of ions, uh, and um, it's, it actually went, it worked better in a vacuum. And uh, now with, I, I was interested because I, I could explain this with my theory, basically uh, that the uh, positive charges would create gravitational wells, just like our, our current concept of a gravitational well around a massive object. Whereas electrons would would do the opposite, they create gravity hills, which in effect you'd say is a, a gravitational repulsion effect. And so, if you look at Brown's disk, according to my theory, uh, you get a g a gravity potential hill, g hill, in, towards the negative charge end of the craft, and a g well towards the positive. And so there'd be an effect a gravitational gradient created across it, which would tend to propel it forward. Well, I know that in uh, 52, he put on a demonstration to the uh, Office of Naval Research. It's uh, kind of interesting that uh, why would they end up classifying a whole project, uh, his whole concept, uh, a year later, if there wasn't this uh, serious take, uh, this approach to take him seriously. Okay, well, I believe that there are many ways to create a gravitational effect, uh, or at least the approaches I've seen, I've heard of, are quite different. It's like various uh, ways to skin the cat, I guess. Uh, now, Brown was using high voltage charge, 
and it appears that that technology is used on the B2. It, it involves using a maser in this case. This, is a, this would be a different approach than what Brown was doing. This is using microwaves to create pushes uh, to be able to push on a distant surface. Now, retracing the path of the incoming waves. This is a, a very well-known technology in the area of optics and it's, oh, there's a lot of literature on it in, uh, for use in la with lasers, but you find nothing in the air of microwaves, and I believe the reason is it's very highly classified because of its ability to be used for UFO propulsion. And the, the beauty of this is that the microwaves stay in the beam. They don't scatter out. That's the nature of it. So you uh, pump up your beam, in effect, with energy, and it's not lost. It's like you're putting your energy into a tube. It's a resonator. And so, in effect, you could create a craft that's standing on poles. They, they in effect, become like solid poles between the craft and the ground. And uh, this, this is how the, uh, for example, the TR-3B, uh, there's some talk about this using anti-gravity technology, and it has three uh, thrusters on the bottom. Well, this, this is what the thrusters would be. The, the, there have been triangular UFOs. Uh, the TR-3B is one of the triangular-shaped UFOs uh, that we've heard about. The, the UFOs that may be of alien origin, disc-shaped, and some of them may be some that we have created ourselves, uh, probably use this technology. Uh, you often see three dome, uh, domes underneath. I believe these are actually microwave transmitters for the beams. I think Robert Lazar has <coughs> spoken about uh, his experience with a few of these uh, devices at uh, Area 51. Uh, my first uh, exposure to the discovery that this uh, anti-gravity research was quite a big area, not talked about very much, uh, but it, that it was a major endeavor by major aerospace corporations. This uh, came from this report, Electrogravitic Systems, which I found very revealing. This is a photocopy. Uh, the way I came about this report, I was at the Library of Congress uh, looking under gravitation to see if there was anything closely, uh, remotely uh, touching on the subject of electrogravitics, which I had at that time in 1985 just become acquainted with its existence through some articles about Townsend Brown. And there was only one card in the whole catalog uh, which came close to this, and this was about this report. And it, interestingly, it was missing from the stacks, and they had to do a uh, search, computer search, to see where could there be another one. And uh, the fellow said, this must be a very rare report. He says, it's only one other library in the whole U.S. And I said, where is that? He said, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. So I went ahead and uh, ordered it through an interlibrary loan request, and I was surprised that they actually uh, sent the copy to me. It's actually a red, this is red uh, cardboard jacket, and it's bound to the side. And uh, this was put, produced by a group called Aviation Studies International, which is kind of a think tank in London that produces intelligence reports. And uh, they were, they've been in existence for, well, they're still in existence, and this report was dated 1956. And it was basically trying to encourage uh, the aircraft industry to develop Brown's technology, uh, Townsend Brown's electrogravitics technology, uh, with the idea of developing a Mach 3 fighter craft or maybe even to commercialize it. Uh, so we, instead of taking jets, we will fly uh, much faster with electrogravitics.